Good evening. Welcome to the Center for Creativity. My name is Anina Collier. I am the Dean and George Kaiser Family Foundation Endowed Chair, there I got it all out, of the Center for Creativity. And we are so glad you're here. Um, I am guessing that this may be one of the first times that some of you have come uh, to our facility. And we really hope you come back. Uh, all of the events that we sponsor here at the C4C, as we call it, are free and open to the public. And whether that's a guest artist visit like David, or our I Can't workshop series, or a First Friday event, or one-off events like our TED events, we would love to have you come back. Um, tonight, I want to give a huge thank you to the Tulsa Office of Film, Music, Arts, and Culture, and my dear friend, Abby Curran. Yay! for sponsoring the wonderful food and drink that we've been enjoying tonight, and also for their help with marketing and promotion of the event. Uh, if you don't know about their creativity database and you're a creative of any sort, you want to know about it, uh, make sure to check out the posters uh, in the corners because it's some people think of it as a film location database, which it certainly is, but it's a great way for film crew, artists, musicians to promote yourself and get on people's radar. So please sign up for that, it's free, uh, and the website is right there. Um, I also want to thank Jeff Houston for volunteering to moderate our Q&A tonight. He did a lot of research and I'm so excited to, uh, to hear all of the questions and you'll get a chance to uh, ask questions, so please think of those. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you a little bit about Jeff. Jeff Houston has worked full-time in film and video production for over 20 years in Tulsa as a director, writer, and editor for commercial-based projects first for Impact Productions and now Steelhouse Productions. He has also worked as a freelance film critic and writer for almost two decades. As a longtime member and current vice president of the Oklahoma Film Critics Circle, Jeff is the lead film critic for the Tulsa Voice. He also publishes current film reviews and commentary at his website, ICan'tUnseeThatMovie.com. Best website name ever. In addition, Jeff co-hosts a film conversation podcast called The Bad and the Beautiful with Charles Elmore. As a speaker and commentator, Jeff has hosted a variety of special events at Tulsa's Circle Cinema, providing introductions and commentary for classic film screenings, as well as moderating Q&As and panel discussions. So we're so happy to have him here to moderate this discussion tonight, along with David Reed James, who we've had the pleasure of working with now. It feels like a couple weeks with the media stuff you've been doing. Uh, David Reed James has been a professional sculptor for over 20 years. Since 1997, he has created huge immersive sets and props for more than 55 major motion pictures, including Black Panther, Avatar, Pirates of the Caribbean, Transformers, Team America, Jurassic World, National Treasure, Indiana Jones, Kill Bill, and Guardians of the Galaxy 2, just to name a few. We'll get to hear a lot more about that. Uh, but he's also an artist outside of his work in film, uh, employing whimsical, conceptual, and kinetic elements often created using discarded and repurposed materials. A great stellated dodecahedron shape made from real cheese pizza slices and a moving ring of dominoes that perpetually knock themselves down are some examples. David conceived, designed, and created a 2,000 square foot area of an immersive interactive art installation called The Experience in AHA Tulsa's Arts District. Has anybody seen that? All right, good. Yeah, I think you still have a little bit of time. It's still there. Uh, which opened to the public in the summer of 2018 and runs just to this winter. So go see that. Uh, again, we're so glad you're here, and please help me give a huge welcome to Jeff Houston and David Reed James. Good evening. Thank you all for being here so much. Um, and just as you heard, that list of films um, from you know Black Panther and Pirates of the Caribbean, as long you know. With these various Marvel movies, Steven Spielberg movies, like Minority Report, all those titles that we listed is just scratching the surface of what David has done for the last two decades plus. I mean, literally, if you think of a major blockbuster, he's worked on it. Not he's maybe worked on it, but he's worked on it, or franchise, um, along with major directors like Spielberg and Tarantino. And so just, uh, 
not to mention the, uh, as we, and we're gonna highlight later on in our discussion about the experience um, and just his own work as a solo artist uh, aside from his professional work. So um, to get started, David, um, before we get into the deep dive of how you got started and you know, really talking about your career in depth, let's just create a foundation for what you do, okay? So kind of paint a picture for us at a, at a broad but fundamental level of, well, like if we, when we go to the movies that you work on, when we watch those movies, what, what of yours do we see when we see it? Just give us a, paint a picture for us, uh, if you will. Um, so everything I build is out of foam. I'm in a sculptor's union, LA base, and we're pretty much only allowed to work with foam. Um, foam is always hard-coded and made to painted and made to not look like foam, made to look like <laughs> exactly. exactly what it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, uh, often, so we'll make anything the actors are interacting with is usually actually there, it's not CG. So um, if they're sitting on it or handling it, if it's like a weapon or um, I, I've built you know, small props and I've built environments that are literally the size of a football field, you know, huge like the ape city for uh, the Mark Wahlberg Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that was all actually built, you know, and they do CG, like in, in many cases they'll CG like from 10 feet up. Enhancements or broadening it out, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For, for establishing shots, but um, you know, m more than people realize is, is actually there, at least for the films I've, I've been hired to work on. So. And so you're working on a combination of both set pieces as well as props, or do you uh, specialize more in one than the other? Or is it sort of a, a split of both? I'd say, yeah, I usually do more um, background stuff or um, I do really big work, okay. usually. Mm -hmm. it's, it's rare that I get to do small things. Mm -hmm. And did you have some photos? Yeah. Um, just to give, a, again, kind of yeah. an idea yeah. of yeah. the scale of what you're working on. Yeah, so this is uh, for the Jim Carrey Grinch, um, part of Whoville. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a lot of styrofoam. The styrofoam is usually uh, reinforced with metal and wood, uh, especially like here, the, you know, there were these floating staircases, um, more like a little further along. Uh, so, yeah. And this is all happening during, obviously, pre-production. That's the, yeah. the bulk of where you work, is that correct? With maybe a little bleed over into production? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm always pre-production and I really enjoy when I get to overlap with production because it means catered food. <laughs> and occasionally we meet or interact with the actors. And, that's and so as you're going through this, um, uh, even just talk about uh, uh, like sort of the, I guess the, the work structure, the authority structure, like who's your boss and like when we think about when we're looking at a movie, we see a credit for a production designer or set designer. Where in the, I guess, line do you kind of fall in? Yeah, the, so the production designer is in charge of the look of the entire picture, right? Uh, and I work with the production designer sometimes closely, sometimes I barely see them during mm -hmm. the whole movie. And there's, there's art directors underneath the production designer. Usually I work more closely with them um, and, you know, below the art directors is my, you know, the lead sculptor. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been a lead sculptor on a few jobs, but mostly I'm like, you know, uh, a hired hand. Got gotcha. you coming in and just sculpting what has been yeah. People, yeah, find out. Great. Awesome. Um, okay. Um, uh, so before we get into the uh, actual, just kind of starting at the beginning, so to speak, is there anything else just in a fundamental way you'd like to cover in terms of 
what you do, how it happens, just, a, just to kind of give a full picture. Um, or anything else in the photos so, that we have. Well, actually, let's go here. So this is building Mount Crumpet, and you can see a lot of like raw sort of cubic looking blocks of styrofoam as well as foam that we've hacked into with uh, modified gardening tools. Um, use like a garden hoe with teeth cut into it that are sh that's sharpened. And it's, um, it's labor intensive and it's exhausting and um, yeah. And is it del? I mean, we're talking about styrofoam here. We're talking. I about mean, styrofoam. so it's like, does something get cut off, and you're like, I got to start this whole thing over again, kind of a situation, or how does that work sometimes? Um, yeah, you know, one benefit to working with styrofoam is it's really easy to repair for the most part, and obviously cheap. Mm -hmm. So if you make a mistake, usually you're not sweating it too much. Usually not. Yeah. I mean, there there are mistakes that can <laughs> set you cost back a lot, yeah. but yeah. Um, so, oh, I just, just a, an aside. So while we were working on Mount Crumpet, you can see, so we were going into the pit. This is at Universal Studios. We're going like, there's like the stage floor and there's below the stage floor, which is where they do water effects and things. So we had the whole, like as low as you can go to as high as you can go. Um, and we were working in the summer and when we got up to working in, they, they call them the perms, the permanent structure of the soundstage. When we got to the top, it was incredibly hot and miserable. Mm -hmm. So every lunch break, just about every lunch break on the Grinch, I went on the Jurassic Park ride at Universal Studios. You can <laughs> sneak into the park and it was real close. Nice. And it was a water ride, so I got wet. And That's often, how you refreshed. Yeah, 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 yeah. so awesome. I've been on, that ride about a hundred <laughs> times. And I just found out they're redoing it, so you'll never be able to go on that ride. Oh. It, it's gonna be like a Jurassic World ride now. There you go. Anyway, okay, this is uh, a cannon I made for um, Pirates of the Caribbean 2 and 3. Um, so I made one, and then mold makers, you know, uh, cast it and made a whole bunch of fiberglass ones I think they ended up making. 20 or 30. Um, actually, the lead mold maker, I thought this was a huge honor. He took, he, he made one for himself and used it in his backyard to like swing and hit a hmm. gong. So, he loved your work that much that so you wanted I, to yeah, duplicate the, it. And yeah. So um, this is a, an organ, um, you know, nautical themed pipe organ. For Pirates of the Caribbean 2 and 3, um, part of the Flying Dutchman ship. Another, so this is for Evan Almighty. Um, that's all, it's all styrofoam is the, the substructure. We built mm -hmm. this in LA and in sections that were, each section was about the size of a VW bug. And then all those sections were shipped from LA to Virginia. Um, Rosé is where we set up. And then we, uh, the, the yellowish foam on top of the styrofoam is, is these urethane panels that we gave a, a like real precise wood grain. So, um, and then, okay, this is looking down into the arc from about 100 feet. Um, I'm up in a lift and it was, it's really scary going up in a lift like straight up when nothing's near you. When you're near something, it's, I don't know, somehow I feel comfortable, but. And just yeah. explain for me again, as a novice, um, why on something like this specifically, you're using styrofoam instead of wood, since it's supposed to in a, a, in effect a wood structure. Yeah, okay, so they did use a lot of wood uh, here. So we used styrofoam for the front of the ship and most of the straight parts, like for the back, were, were actual wood. Um, so we were trying to match the actual wood. But the reason for that was the compound curves. It's really hard to do all that quickly with wood. Mm, okay. um, yeah. So, and I mean, that's all actually built. You know, they did CG that to make it look 
probably three times that long, but it was huge. Yeah. Um, they had uh, real animals going up that ramp, um, including elephants. So they had the the amp, the sorry, the ramp was rated for like a thousand pounds for for every square foot or something. It's really like overbuilt. Uh, this is for Batman versus Superman. This is like sort of assembly line for um, we we're making Superman's birth chamber, which literally like architectural vaginas. <laughs> um, so it's like literally a birth chamber. Mm -hmm. um, here's another image of sort of further along. Uh, this is reference for a, a, a thing I made for Black Panther, and this is the actual mm -hmm. thing. This is for Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Uh, this is like a Star-Lord's dad, um, part of his floating pod thing. This was amazing to, to be into. I think this would make a great, like, public installation. You don't really see it in the movie um, that much. It, yeah, as much as... Mm -hmm. And again, that styrofoam, is it, is it a combination of things? It's, uh, yeah, it's mostly reinforced styrofoam. Okay. And that process is, best case scenario, we just make it out of styrofoam. Then we slice it all in half, cut a trough out, and welders put a... Um, you know, a, a metal structure inside, and then we glue it all back together. Um, sometimes the welders just create the structure first and we clad around it, and often things go wrong that way because they, um, I don't know, often they haven't paid enough attention to the blueprints or whatever sure. and things don't look right. <laughs> and then you can't change it. If, if you make it all out of styrofoam, foam, uh, the art directors love it because they can just, hmm. you know, you can change things with, with ease. Uh, this is another piece for Guardians of Galaxy. We, Galaxy 2. We made a ton of this stuff. Um, this is from Minority Report. This is the um, chamber where the clairvoyants are sort of in the bath. And that sort of triangle thing. And the so what is that ceiling? Because it seems, if I'm remembering the film correctly, more reflective. Is that correct? That's all styrofoam okay. that's been hard-coated with truck bed liner. Okay. So it's super durable, as durable as your truck bed. And uh, this was an amazing set, again, to sort of just experience. And again, it sort of doesn't come across on film the way it did being there. Like, it, you really lost your depth perception because all those grooves were really deep. And, uh, it was, it was just hard to tell mm -hmm. how close you were to the wall that was right next to you. Um, so I'd love to create something like this that's semi-permanent, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, this is just raw foam. This is what it looks like. You know, we just get tons of these walls. Literally tons. So that, that's obviously where it starts, and then you just, you find it within within those blocks. Yeah. Um, oh, let's see. I think we can start this. Um, oh, a little, a little louder. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, it'd be great. Um, and so this here. Oh, this is Black, Black Panther. Panther. Okay, great. Uh, this is like the uh, Wakanda, the, the waterfall area. Um, and this was like, I mean, we, we made, I think it was about 50 feet high. And they, you know, they CG'd it to make it look 200 feet high or something, but. That's where a they, lot of the it, actors were and on yeah, that. And there's yeah. some major scenes in this particular Absolutely. area, yeah. yeah. Um, and fight scenes, action stuff, so obviously durability is, is key here as well. Yeah, and we were making this in January, and they shot it in, I think, late February, and it was literally freezing cold. Like, mm -hmm. um, there was ice on what we were working, and the wow. actors were, 
having to pretend they were in desert weather. Right. When they're, they're shirtless. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. It's kind of insane. This is in Atlanta? In Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. So that's Marvel's hub at this point, essentially, right? It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all the big budget fantasy movies are, are being made in Atlanta right now. It's a hotter spot than LA for that style movie. LA, most of the uh, sound stages are big budget TV now. Mm -hmm. um, so with all of this kind of created as a foundation for what you do, let, now let's go back in time, okay? okay? And uh, really kind of starting at the origins. Um, as with so many uh, master craftsmen in their trade, uh, we can see inklings and beginnings of those things in childhood, just things that you, gra you gra gravitate towards and that you did just naturally as a child. Um, there was one event in particular in your childhood. Talk about that as maybe your first major expression of getting into this. Yeah, uh, so my brother and I used to build a Halloween tunnel every year. We did it for about seven years. We charged a piece of candy to get in. <laughs> Sometimes kids would put a rock in a wrapper and um, we would get our candy. Charlie Brown, you basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, you know, and it started out with, uh, so it, it was a tunnel made of um, appliance boxes, refrigerator and washer and dryer boxes dad would take us like in August and we'd gather up all these boxes and make a sort of a, a linear maze through the backyard and uh, you know it started out with like you know peeled grapes and you touch them in their eyeballs and spaghetti for brains and then it just like we got more and more elaborate every year and uh, oh is this, yeah. the so, design? So this is one of the uh, more elaborate things we made, uh, just a crappy rendering. <laughs> but, and so when you're um, at that age, are you blueprinting it or are you just kind of making it as you go? What age are you and you your know, brother? And I'm seven years younger than my brother, so my brother gets most of the credit for okay. this design. But uh, we repurposed the doghouse, made this ramp going up, and then this other ramp that sort of was hinged coming off the other side of the doghouse. And it was counterbalanced by these buckets filled with water. So it looks like you can climb across and reach this crystal ball. But the further you climb, then your, your weight causes it to trap door down. And then you slide into a vat full of tennis balls that we collected for free behind a, a, mm -hmm. a tennis um, court. Really, yeah, just, we gathered about it. 400 tennis balls. And so you were just doing this, again, I guess just by extension of a passion or just uh, you got a kick out of it or was it, was it a mutual uh, fascination with the creation as well as seeing people react to it, kind of that whole collective thing? Yeah, I think all of the above. Yeah, we were just like kind of challenging each other like how much more can we do? Um, my brother also, uh, got me interested like we used to make forts out of furniture constantly and i just did blankets yeah <laughs> so i didn't get that elaborate yeah so we used sheets and added mm -hmm. box fans to the sheets and made oh, sort okay. of inflatable um you know forts but uh my parents tolerated a lot <laughs> um, and then in, so uh before you, uh, while you were still in school and into high school, was this sort of a major focus what you did or were there other expressions as well that you can think of that where you can look back and say, this is, was from the root of what uh, I, I pursued professionally? Or was it just more stuff like this and the other things you mentioned? Yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. My parents gave me a lot of freedom and I had this wonderful art teacher who was actually the mother of uh, my friend, my best friend in high school, Gray Hill, who ultimately helped get me into the film industry. His father did the Ghostbusters uh, gargoyles. Um, it was the only reason I even knew there was a sculptor's union. Um, but yeah, his, his mom was my art teacher. She gave me a ton of freedom. I don't know, I just always had this desire to build big, weird stuff. Mm -hmm. I made some giant 
spheres out of PVC when I was in, uh, I guess, high school. And my parents were gone for, I don't know, a weekend. And they came back, and I had all these <laughs> PVC spheres on the roof. And my dad was actually nice. pretty upset. He, yeah. <laughs> I probably did what mess up. What is going on? Yeah. yeah. And it's on the roof, so you're getting up on the roof. Was, and what yeah, does that exactly. entail? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, so, OK, so that's sort of your childhood experience. Then you uh, go into college, which it's fitting that we're here at a community college because you began at a community college. So yeah. when you went to community college, um, what were you pursuing at that time? And how did that help continue to steer you towards where you got to? So I wanted to make experimental short films. And it seemed like the only outlet for that was really music videos. So like at the time, there was 1990s. No, no real, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. no real internet. And short films uh, were just not seen anywhere, except for like Spike and Mike animation festivals, which I loved. I went to every one of those I could find. And this is, you're in Southern California? Southern right? California. Okay. That's where yeah. you grew up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so those sick and twisted animation festivals. Um, yeah. Uh, so your community college experience, what did you study there, and how did that oh, continue to steer you? OK, so I went to uh, De Anza Community College. The reason I really wanted to go there was because you could get uh, firsthand hands-on experience with 16 millimeter film and, uh, and all the equipment right out the door. Like you, uh, some of the major universities, you have to have two years of theory before you can touch anything. Mm, right. So um, yeah, I got to be hands-on hands -on. real quick. Um, and uh, yeah, I got to do some fun stuff. I, I made some, uh, you know, I, I dabbled in stop motion animation, uh, which sort of led to um, my first experience using Hotwire and uh, you know Styrofoam. So talk about that experience. So this is again, this is before you got into feature films and well before that. How did you first start working with these yeah. tools that you're now working with professionally today? So I was driving back home for uh, I guess the summer from Northern California to Southern, and stopped by a Denny's in Pasadena and happened to run into a friend of my brother's who was um, uh, making music videos for Oingo Boingo, Danny Elfman's mm -hmm. former band, and uh, a band called Caius. Some of the members of Caius are now Queens of the Stone Age. So he was making these two videos at the same time and just asked me if I wanted to help. So of course, I just dropped everything and helped. and, and uh, I did it unpaid for about a week and a half, and I still had this job at this record store. And was this your first time with Hotwire? My first time with Hotwire, not my first time making stuff. You know, we used plaster and some other things, too. Um, but uh, yeah, first time using Styrofoam, really. Um, and eventually, they decided, yeah, we'll pay you, and so I I was able to sort of keep my record store job just like going in a few hours a, a week. But, um, but I'm, I'm mostly, I just focused on the Oingo Boingo video. It was for a song called Insanity. It's on their last album. Um, I just focused on that. And uh, I mean, we were working crazy hours toward the end. Mm -hmm. um, I remember like, oh, I did some animation for it too. I, uh, I was looking through a camera, and I just, like, my eyes were going into REM state because I'd been <laughs> up so long. Um, and I, I just, I, I would sleep on the floor, you know. It was, it was no <laughs> and then, so uh, with that initial experience, uh, what led to just, I guess, more growth in your disciplines, whether that be not just working more with styrofoam and hot wire, but then what other tools of the trade began to come into play as well that you, that you grew into and began to expand your tool set? You know, um, my tool set didn't really, like I didn't focus on foam right after this music video experience. I, I went back to school and I thought, 
doors would open for me quickly. And they didn't really. It was about three years until a huge door opened. Um, what did that then, three then years, I, look before the huge door opened, what did life look like sort of post-college and career breakthrough? Um, you know, I was at a point where I thought I was going to do wedding videos, <laughs> like that was going to be my way to make money out, you know, after school or even during school. Um, I met a, a very close friend. Uh, his name is Jonan Vasquez. He went to the same college. He did a comic book at the time that had a lot of success called Johnny the Homicidal Maniac and uh, eventually did a show for Nickelodeon called Invader Zim, um, which has a, a pretty big cult following. Anyway, uh, we, I, I traveled across the country for a month with him um, videotaping his uh, like uh, comic signings at different mm -hmm. different comic book stores around the country. I think we did 30 signings in a month or something. So I was like filming him, and uh, then we were on our way back to California in Utah. It was like one of the last stops, and I get a call from my friend Gray. He's like, they need people on Godzilla. This is the Matthew Broderick Godzilla. Like, so I just dropped everything and flew to LA and was, you know, working at Sony the next day. And it was a really surreal experience. So this is 1997. That's obviously yeah. your breakthrough. That's what kind of gets you in the door. Yeah. Um, talk about that first experience and what that was like and from what you learned to what you got yeah. to experience and just what that was. Yeah. Um, I made a lot of mistakes and uh, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I think one thing that sort of helped me, there, there were maybe a dozen other people in my position, like a dozen other, you're called a permit before you're actually in the union. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, I, I guess I, um, I, I think I was just maybe mellow enough that they wanted to work with me again. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times they'll give a permit 28 days, like they'll cut you off right before you get your 30 days. If you get 30 days and you pay your dues, you're in the union. And, um, but if they don't like you. So, oh, okay, so <laughs> if they cut you off at 28 days, that means they don't like yeah. you, basically. And okay. just getting in the union doesn't mean you're, you're set. Like, you still have to, um, it's sort of like every job is like, Picking a basketball team, it's sort of, sort of like high school. Like, mm -hmm. so the lead sculptor will just choose the people he thinks, you know, are either best fit for the job or, you know, will let him win at the golf game. You know? Well, I, I, mean, I mean, it always is a combination of, you know, for as much as you, you know, anybody desires talent and skill, they also don't want to work with jerks. Right? Yeah. <laughs> You know, because particularly in a film set, which is so uh, intensive and film shoots and you know all that can be long and, and pre-production uh, seasons can be long. So I, w were there, uh, maybe just by virtue of you being mellow, that kind of <laughs> solved a lot of issues, but were there learning experiences along the way as well for you in terms oh, of yeah. figuring out, yeah, talk about that. Um, did, you know. did any like run-ins in particular stick out to you? <laughs> or no? <laughs> I mean, you know, the lead sculptor asked me right off the bat if I knew how to use a table saw. I'm like, oh, yeah. And, you know, of course. But then, for some reason, we were cutting foam on a table saw, and um, which, in retrospect, we should have been using a hot wire. Anyway, um, you know, some stuff grabbed and launched, and I thought, okay, I'm, this is my last day. I'm, <laughs> they're going to mm -hmm. fire me for sure. But. I don't know. I, I just kept kept marching on, and it seemed to be forgotten. And I don't know. And I guess maybe just again, a lot of it just has to do with how you deal with the situation and that sort of scenario when things happen, and um, yeah, and just I being suppose. a guy you can, a person that somebody can work with. Yeah, yeah that's a big part of it. I, I think like a lot of 
um, I mean, I think it's true with any job, like the people you're working with make a huge difference as far as the, you know, your happiness during the job. I've worked on movies that really aren't my cup of tea, but I've worked with a great crew and it's been mm -hmm. a wonderful experience. You know? And the opposite's been true too. I've worked on films that I really love and it's been a horrible experience. Mm -hmm. um, so Godzilla was the big break, yeah. and did that essentially make it easier for you to get into the union? Yeah, I got into the union on Godzilla officially. I got exactly 30 days, just squeaked in, and... Uh, uh, so there really wasn't like a catch, because I know sometimes in the industry there can be kind of a catch-22 scenario of you can't get work if you're not union, but, uh, y you know, um, uh, it's hard to get the job to begin with in order to get the union. And so um, have you noticed that, at least in your career path, as long as you kind of stick to that diligence, it's, it's more of a clear path as opposed to a sort of a catch-22 situation? Yeah, um, I guess I got really lucky in a lot of ways. Um, uh, a lot of, like, the sort of the other route to getting where I am is to just move to LA and work in the non-union shops constantly uh, that are usually, you know, smaller scale, but more dangerous. And, you know, the, I mean, I've worked, I, I did work some non-union shops and uh, you're not sure if you're gonna be paid, you mm -hmm. know. But, uh, so people would work their way up in those non-union shops and eventually work with union people and, and get in. But I sort of just, happened to get on this fast track. And so you kind of hinted at it with the non-union work, but even with major productions, um, give, paint an idea about uh, how intensive the work is. Obviously, it's not all glamor, and I think, you know, just uh, some fundamental level, we understand that. But just talk about uh, what a whether a work day looks like or a work season through the course of a film production, um, how intensive it can be, and even how dangerous it can be. Yeah, um, so I almost always work 12 hour days, five days a week. Often it's more than that, um, six and seven day weeks. I worked on, you know, uh, Supernova, I think. I didn't have a day off in two months. It was just solid 12 hour days. Um, and it just, it's not only like physically abusive, but your mind just goes numb after a while too. And I honestly think it's not the way to do things because <laughs> everybody is just drooling, you know, they're not, they're not focused. So, um, yeah, and, and I work, okay, um, like the first three or four years I was in the union, there were a lot of, severe accidents, like people died. About a dozen people, both construction, uh, yeah, mostly construction people um, died or were severely injured. Um, and you, would you attribute, attribute that to just freak accidents or things that have since been so, a little bit more regulated? Yeah, so they started a safety training course after all these accidents. Um, and it's, it's helped, like there hasn't been as many tragedies, but Hollywood is really good at covering up like major catastrophes in many cases. Like some of these people who died did not get in memory of credit, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there was a major fire at Disney on the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie that nobody ever heard about. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, what are some of, I guess, uh, describe your job in terms of what can be perilous about it? Oh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm up in, a, up in a lift a lot, so heights. Um, uh, yeah, so there's, there's boom lifts and there's scissor lifts. Um, uh, boom lifts can go 125 feet high in some cases, um, and, you know, uh, I worked on the last X-Files episode uh, in an, an 80-foot boom lift, 
that was parked on sand mm. and my last work day on the job, like it, it was everyone's last work day, so the construction foreman and everyone was partying at lunch and they came back and the, so the construction foreman is driving the lift that I'm in that's on sand out in Anza Borrego Desert. We were building um, uh, ruins, like Native American ruins that were gonna be blown up by helicopters. Was so it windy? It was, uh, it was a little windy, it was incredibly hot. Hmm. Um, and yeah, miserable, like you're sweating. We're working with urethane foam because if you blow up styrofoam, it looks white. So this was green urethane foam that looked kind of, it was like a more of a gray color. So when it blew up, it, it looked like ruins. But uh, so, so you're getting this urethane foam all over you while you're sweating. Anyway, so this, you know, um, this guy is smashed and he's driving me around in this lift and I could have, you know, it, it, a wrong move could have catapulted both of us out of the lift. It was really a dangerous situation. And so the one situation I think of looking back, like I should have said something. Put your foot down or yeah. some, to some degree, you yeah. address it, yeah. Yeah, and I guess that's obviously learning experiences, but I guess in other situations you just feel like we got a deadline and, right. and even when everybody's on the same page and uh, they're all professional, there's still issues of deadlines and tasks that need to be done and so on right. and so forth. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, they always want it yesterday, um, yeah. Um, so uh, in terms of like uh, the typical work day, when you're out, uh, is it really just a full situation where like, if you're on, you know, uh, in pre-production, is it like a literal bubble? Like you don't even know what's even going on in the world for about two months or how plugged or unplugged are you from reality, I guess? Yeah, I'm pretty unplugged. Like I don't. Uh, Every week, waking moment is work? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I listen to podcasts when I can <laughs> now, um, but Often you have to communicate with a partner or whatever, so you can't even do that. But whenever I can, I try to put my head in a, another space. I go mm -hmm. camping in my mind, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, we're it, it's a circus lifestyle, and when you're in the circus, that's all you do. And so, um, yeah, share with me just about some of the, I guess, best projects you've been able to work on over these 20 years, specifically thinking about it in this context, whether it be uh, the big films that uh, you can look back and they were great formative experiences and that you were excited to be a part of and that they were big successive and successes and specific memories that you might have of those, as well as maybe films that weren't necessarily successes but might have still been a success for you as a craftsman and your experience in it. So like from our perspective, we might look like that was a good movie, that was a bad movie, but do you have a different perspective on maybe some of those? Yeah, so I made, uh, I worked on Kill Bill, which is a movie I really like. Um, I made, but what I made for Kill Bill wasn't really glamorous. I made the dirt that Uma Thurman climbs out of on her way out of the grave. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. <laughs> um, you know, so it wasn't like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not, in, not, you know, the kid is killing in the title, so there's a little safe. Not necessarily there, yeah. a yeah. portfolio piece, but mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, I guess I had fun working on it. Um, yeah, and then, well, I got to work on Team America, is another film I really have fun watching for sure. So you're working and, in miniature there. Yeah, yeah, and that was a great experience. I, I rarely get to work in miniature, and that was really fun. Uh, a lot of times for like gremlins and miniature stuff, they use creature shops, which are usually non-union. Um, and they're, and really underpaid, like it's amazing. There are so many people wanting to do horror creatures. There's just so much demand for that. Mm -hmm. They don't pay them as well as we get paid for making, you know, landscapes in some cases. And I guess part of that is just due to the fact of when you look at box office grosses, genre films can, you know, to that degree can be lower grossing, so the pay ratio might be lower, whereas 
you know, a big blockbuster, you know, the more money that makes, the more money you get paid. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, usually if I'm working on a movie, it's got a huge budget. Doesn't mean the movie's going to be good, but mm -hmm. it means it, there's a lot of money behind it. Because um, for whatever reason, there's this idea that uh, sculptors are really expensive. And part of it is just the politics of the, the union. I mean, we're, we're usually hired by construction, so there's an incentive for them to make as much as possible out of wood. Mm -hmm. We get a higher rate than the construction people, so, but we can usually do the same thing and much quicker and cheaper um, material-wise. And so, uh, and also, um, does a film come to mind or an experience come to mind, again, where maybe, we, you know, as the public is concerned, that wasn't a success, but from your perspective, it was a success. And maybe, just from my own personal perspective, if I can use a recent, even current example, um, the new film, Alita if any of you have seen it. Um, it's exactly the kind of movie, if I was 14 years old, I would have absolutely loved it. I'm not 14 years old, so I was kinda, you know, my, uh, I really couldn't care less what was happening, but it looked amazing, right? And every uh, visual artist on that film should be extremely proud of what they did. So do you have similar experiences like that? Yeah, I, I guess the film that comes to mind is Cat in the Hat. Uh, the Mike Myers, which, you know, the end result was not my cup of tea at all, but, but the work we did for it was amazing. We made perfect, precision, giant um, objects, a giant hat, a giant uh, hand holding a, a lipstick. Um, uh, yeah, well, sort of like Klaus Oldenbergian mm -hmm. props but they were all like really tight, high precision, and uh, they come across on screen as looking like they're CG because they're just too perfect. Um, but yeah, that's an example of like work I'm really proud of. I, I got to design, well, I, I created this cr contraption to make a perfect giant lollipop. I made this mechanical device that would, so you could sand a perfect spiral and uh, so I was proud of that. Um, but yeah, did a lot of work for Cat in the Hat that I'm really proud of. <laughs> Don't, you know. I'm Despite not its failure at the box yeah, office, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and can you think of also uh, just some, uh, maybe some formative experiences, like a particular film or a particular project that really ended up being, you know, a crucial stage for you in your career, your development, or just your experience in the business? Uh, you know, it sounds like, like when I work on a film like Avatar or something that gets a big amount of, uh, whatever, success. Um, and were you like building Pandora or? You know, I built a lot of uh, spaceship interiors. Uh, I, I did a little bit of, uh, I, I made some plants too. Mm -hmm. They were really strict on that job about, I, I don't have many pictures from that because it was like super tight. They called it Project 880. There's a working title for most films I work on, but some are much more relaxed than others. That was super, don't talk about anything. Yeah. So you mostly ship work. I kind of uh, took you on a tangent to bring you back. What was it about that experience that you really valued? Oh. Other than it just being a big movie. Well, um, I mean, I think it was a, a great, opportunity to work on that film, but it wasn't really, um, you know, th the work wasn't necessarily that great. Like I was making stuff that would be painted blue. The actors could interact with it, but it was never like fully finished. That was one rare example of that. Usually everything I do is fully painted, you know, and hard coded and it's, it's better quality than, um, than theme parks or, you know, mm -hmm. I'd say it's, it's usually museum quality, you know, really. Because so much, of, you never know when that's going to be in close up. I mean, it has to be right. in that detail. And on that note, like, so frequently, like, w we make stuff for the 
art director, production designer. We make stuff for their portfolio, mm. you know, is what it comes down to because often we'll make stuff perfect, so much attention to detail, spend weeks, months on something, and literally, in many cases, it'll be out of focus, in the background, mm -hmm. at night, could have been made out of cardboard, no one would know the difference. Mm -hmm. But they had the budget and to build the yeah, portfolio. They have the budget and yeah, it looks good for the production designer's portfolio. Can you think of some work that uh, would apply to that, like, like maybe some of your favorite creations that ended up just in the background, so to speak, in, in a movie? Anything come to mind? Uh, well, we worked on a set for Mr. and Mrs. Smith. It was a, a giant, a, a bridge scene. We made the, so the bridge was like an overpass thing. It was all smashed up. We made giant girders that were twisted. We made a semi truck that was hanging off the bridge, you know, foam so it wouldn't be dangerous so it could hang. Um, and we spent two months making that, making like facade around it. And they wrote it out of the script and never filmed it. Um, wow. Yeah, so I could have <laughs> stayed home and slept and they could have sent me my paycheck. Yeah, I guess at the very least you do get paid for it. So that's great. Um, just a couple more things before we open up to some questions from the audience. Um, we are getting into, or we have gotten into certainly, uh, the, the realm of CGI in terms of what we see in blockbusters and and the increasing scale of that. How has that, if at all, affected what you do? Um, how, how does how has the, the, just the increase of CGI affected your job, not only just in terms of how much you work, but uh, how that affects what you build and what you make? Yeah, um, there was fear for a long time that you know we would not exist by now um, because everything would be CG, but I think Actors and uh, people behind the camera still want real stuff to interact with on some level. So it hasn't obviously destroyed my line of work, but it does complement what I do often. You know, they'll, um, I made a lot of things that they put dots on or paint green, and you know, it ends up being CG in the movie, but it's, it's actually built on some level too. Um, and you know, like I said earlier, often, you know, um, well, in, in, in almost every case, for the movies I work on, we build whatever the actors are sitting on or touching or leaning against. And you know, maybe an eight foot distance behind that, then there'll be blue screen behind that and the, you know, the, the city behind the shelves and the stuff we built will be CG or, you know, the, you know, the 100 feet of the castle above the 10 foot that was practically built would be CG. That's why I know, just for me personally, why I appreciate filmmakers like J.J. Abrams uh, or Christopher Nolan who uh, really try to do as much practical as they can. Um, because I, at least just for my eye, uh, even the best CGI environments, I can, st I can still tell they're CGI environments and that, that, that actors are being comped in to those places because at the end of the day, no matter how good they've got the lighting and whatever else, it's not real light on a real thing. Yeah. And so do you, is there to some degree sort of a swing back from let's not get too crazy with CGI, let's try and find a, a, a more of a balance? Yeah, I think it depends on the director. Um, but. Yeah, I think there are a lot of uh, directors and production designers that, that really like seeing practical things. I mean, myself included. Like, I, I love the, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, stop motion animation stuff, Nightmare Before Christmas style things. Um, uh, and those are often, I mean, those, those are all like 3D printed or modeled. Um, characters, heads pop on and off or whatever, but um, but they're computer assisted, mm -hmm. of course. So that's like, um, I think computers are, are, are and CGI are sort of uh, 
working in, in unison, but not like destroying the practical stuff. It seems like a lot of. They're still of, seeing the value yeah. and the desire for what you do, which is, like I said, for me anyway, uh, that's a relief just because I like seeing real worlds and real things and people in those real environments. Yeah, I love puppets, you know? Exactly, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so before we get into some of your uh, personal, uh, non-professional Hollywood stuff, uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, I just want to open it up if there are any questions at this point uh, about uh, uh, what David does or things you might want to hone in on specifically at all. Yes? I'm curious. I've seen the amazing work you do, and you said something once about the glue that you put them together with. Yeah. That really fascinates me. I like to know the mechanics of how things work. Okay, yeah. Um, here, I'm going to. Okay, so like this uh, skull. So, how we created this, we got. A, this is for Kong Skull Island. This, we got a, an ape skull that had been cast in plastic. We literally took that ape skull and put it through a bandsaw and cut up cubes that we could then scale up. So, you know, when we started making this skull, we were working with little cubes, you know, make exactly that cube just 20 times bigger or whatever. And then uh, we use urethane foam, expanding urethane foam, which is basically great stuff or, you know, window insulation, it's basically that is what we use uh, for the glue in most cases. There's also um, spray uh, 78, which is like, like sprayable rubber cement, and it doesn't, that particular formula doesn't eat the styrofoam. Most solvents do. And see Kong Skull Island, seriously. I mean, what Universal is doing with uh, these sort of creature universe that it's building. I, I forget the n specific name of the universe that they have, but uh, with that and Godzilla, um, but like Kong Skull Island, it's, it's fun, but it's smart, and it looks fantastic. Um, anyway, check it out. I just finished a sequel to that. It's Kong versus Godzilla. I was in Hawaii for four months and just got back about a month and a half ago. Um, so we didn't do a lot of bone work, but um, but we did a lot of big stuff. Other question? Yeah. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, when you mentioned styrofoam, I just almost died <laughs> <laughs> because I know styrofoam is not biodegradable. So I'm wondering what you do with all that. Do you recycle any of those props? Do they go to museums or? So, yeah, it sort of depends on what it is. Like this skull would uh, probably be repurposed for a premiere, maybe even end up in a theme park or something like that. If it's just, um, you know, huge walls, um, in many cases, you know, you can uh, cut away the plaster and the impurities and recycle a lot of it. But, um, you know, honestly, in a lot of cases you can't and it ends up as landfill. Um, yeah. On some level, styrofoam, when it's exposed to UV, does biodegrade. It's the layers that are you know, deep inside. It, it just takes longer to get it exposed to UV. But, um, but you know, uh, a lot of sets are a forest of wood, you know? So they chop down, you know, 40 houses worth of wood mm -hmm. <laughs> to, you know, there's, there's no, it's, it's not an environmentally um, perfect industry by any means. It's, you know, they're trying to lean that way in many cases, or at least pretend they are, but. <laughs> but to the extent that they can, yeah. um, like they're not just, you know, storing everything in storage houses, they're, either tearing it down or repurposing it to some degree at times? Yeah. Um, uh, there was a film where they took the whole set and a paintball company bought it, right? And they cut it all up and 
took it out to a desert somewhere so that people could shoot. You know, they used it for their paintball arena. So there are cases like that. Mm. Um, and you know, there are, there are, this happens more than it might seem, but like a production designer or someone in charge, it's like, hey, can you make this these very specific dimensions that don't correspond to anything? And you're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and you find out you're making, you know, their home theater or something, you know. You, um, Off of Disney's budget. Yeah, which I'm yeah. fine with. Like, sure. I'd rather have it go there than be in used. the dumpster. Yeah. yeah. So. Another question? Uh, yeah. I was wondering, you know, I've heard of them doing 3D printing with houses now. Have they ever talked about doing that with some of the sets, and do they do that there at different projects you've worked on? Uh, I've never worked on anything where they've 3D printed something that big. I've, you know, they 3D print models for us, like the vaginas for the Batman versus Superman thing. We got a 3D printed model for that. Um, but uh, we, we do, they are more and more, um, for mechanical stuff especially, CNC routing large chunks of styrofoam. And it's amazing, like, we'll spend so much time cleaning that stuff up in many cases, we could have done it faster, you know, if they just gave it to us to do. Um, there's still a, a big um, sort of uh, tolerance for glitching and error with the CNC stuff that I'm sure will be ironed out probably in the next five years. But right now, it's, uh, I don't know, it seems to create as much work as it takes away. Yeah. I'm curious about the long-term hardwearing of styrofoam if you like if you want to build a house out of that stuff or something it's a very interesting medium but I'm curious about that yeah so it's all about what you um, sort of the substructure you know is it going to take a lot of wind you'll, you'll need to have it metal reinforced um, but also like you just coat it with a shell. Like you can put lath or chicken wire over it, spray it with plaster or some kind of hard coat. And then it's really durable. Like, you know, depending on, you know, if people are jumping up and down on it all day, it'll crack the plaster, but you can do another coat or just do a, a thicker, you know, you just prepare for the areas that are uh, gonna take more abuse. But it's, it's a great underused material, um, in my opinion, yeah. Uh, well, I was curious how you uh, colorize it without damaging the foam, because a lot of paints do that. You'd kind of gone over that a moment ago. But then also, how do you get it so perfectly smooth that you have to do on a lot of sets? You can't have little, like right here, there's little tiny divots here and there, you know? Uh, oh, yeah. How do you get it so perfect, because styrofoam, you know, is a difficult uh, material? Yeah, so it's sort of, I mean, like you would do with wood, you sand it, you know? Um, I mean, that's part of it. Well, also, like, we make these templates like this, you know, and then hot wire around them. If you have skilled people on both sides, you can get pretty smooth, accurate cuts, you know? Um, this is a lot, you know, the way we do a lot of stuff, you know, just, uh, these are just uh, masonite templates on either side, and, you know, got numbers around them, you cut, it, it's, a, it's a, literally a hot wire. Um, it's just a, a straight nichrome wire that gets red hot. Same thing that's in your toaster. And it cuts the foam. And there's an art to sort of, you know, precisely doing it, but, um, like we did some, some of the stuff we did for Cat in the Hat, we made our templates so well, and you know, you know, created things uh, in such a way that we barely had to sand anything. Like, after we made our cuts, it was done. <laughs> uh, it's me again. <laughs> so I was wondering, it looks sort of like a hazard to work with that. 
do they have some sort of health uh, plan for you all? Yeah, I have a really good health plan, but uh, it you know doesn't cure your whatever chemical exposure. So yeah, I wear a respirator often. Styrofoam releases benzene when you cut it. Uh, urethane foam uh, is much more toxic when you cut it with a hot wire. Um, in some cases, like cyanide can be released. Or, you know, um, there's yeah, there's some bad stuff I can be exposed to. So when you're cutting styrofoam, when you're making smoke of any kind, with in, you know, in any case, you you need ventilation so, or a respirator. Um, so I'm going to focus in a little bit more on your personal work, and then we'll open up to some more questions. So still be thinking. Uh, if you want to ask anything. Um, and actually, before we get into your personal work, one final professional industry question. Uh, when you started 20 some years ago, it would probably be safe to assume that it was your, uh, your specific part of the industry was very male dominated. And now, particularly with projects you've worked on recently like Black Panther, A Wrinkle in Time, we're seeing women in the head roles in a lot of those key, de in your department and in your world. Um, just talk about maybe some of the changes that you've seen uh, even recently in how maybe diversity is expanding within your trade. Yeah, um, yeah, more recently, obviously, yeah, Black Panther and Wrinkle in Time are the two prime examples, yeah, where there was uh, really an emphasis on having female leads and uh, yeah I think it's great the, the production designer, designer for Black Panther was one of the best production designers I've worked with I thought she was wonderful she's Academy Award nominated as well so yeah, yeah. And I was happy to see that because I felt like she wasn't treated with the respect she should have been treated with by a lot of people like during the production there, there were people on the job who seemed like they were trying to sabotage her on some level, mm -hmm. but that's not going to happen anymore. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so uh, in, in terms of your personal art, obviously professionally, you're implementing other people's visions. Uh, talk about opportunities to express yourself as an artist, uh, what you like to do, um, even including the example of downtown at the AHA Gallery uh, in the experience, you were one of the five commissioned artists to build this great, again, go check out the experience before it closes. It's really, uh, the installations are an example of modern art that, while we do see that kind of art from time to time at our other uh, galleries and, and uh, like Phil Brook and, so, and Gilcrease, what we're seeing down there in terms of modern art is really what you, you start seeing when you go to places like New York City and things like that. And so just talk about uh, that experience specifically, the experience, and then just generally how you express yourself as a personal artist outside of your professional duties. Yeah. Um, like how did the experience come about, that opportunity? I was headhunted like, uh, I mean, Amber Litwack, I think, sort of was like, I've been Facebook stalking you do you want to do this thing? I was like, yes. Um, but uh, yeah, that was like such a great opportunity. It made me uh, like, uh, that's really the direction I would love to take if, if I you know, had it my way. I'd love to make more immersive experiential things that are highly conceptual. Um, you know, I like the fact that it doesn't go into a landfill. <laughs> and that I can take my daughter to come and touch it and see it and interact with it and, um, you know, making stuff for movies, um, you know, we make these huge things, spend a lot of time and energy making a thing and as soon as you're finished, it's gone. Like, they take it away, it's being painted, it's being taken to the next level and you never see it again. So, if you don't get a picture, you never will. Mm -hmm. like, it, it's just out the door. Um, so, so like, you're working with styrofoam, obviously, in film. 
what materials are you now working with as a solo artist uh, once you can get away from styrofoam? Yeah, so with the experience, I sort of wanted to explore all these materials I don't work with. Um, so I used a lot of, I don't know, repurposed uh, pot lids and um, uh, stuff. Like, <laughs> um, my, my space at the experience um, revolves around these sleep chambers that um, the original concept was someone from the public would sign up to be sleeping in one of these sleep chambers as much as possible. So you would enter this space and you'd see, you know, this portal shape and you'd look through the portal and you wouldn't, hopefully at first, you wouldn't even know if the person in it was real or not. Um, and then, so, the sleep chamber is sort of the hub. It's implied that the dreams of the person sleeping are being sucked out. Literally, there's vacuum cleaners above the head area, sucked out with the sequenced LED lights that sort of create this circulatory system. And then the rest of my space is sort of uh, a manifestation of their dreams, um, which include, or, or nightmares, which include like, burning houses, or there's a thing I call the gum lab where you can, you know, you get a free gumball and you contribute stick to it, it on the yeah. bottom of a desk, which is like that taboo thing that you were always told not to do, and here's a safe space to do it. And you get to be, you know, it's a little bit gross, and but it's beautiful and colorful and I don't know. It's it's and it's its own organic thing that over time has yeah, taken shape. Yeah, it's become so much bigger uh, and you know more interesting than I could have anticipated. And you know, half the Tulsa community has contributed mm -hmm. to it. I think. Yeah. And then there's other more mechanical type stuff like with the domino wheel. Yeah. Um, just so that's another form of artistic expression, just even more from a mechanical perspective. Yeah, um, and all these things, like these are original ideas, original concepts that, you know, it's a challenge to um, make things that are gonna be interacted, uh, interacted with by, you know, hundreds of elementary school kids mm -hmm. who tear the dominoes out of the ring, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, just, just sort of maintenance has been an issue all around, but um, but yeah, uh, the, I I love like the, just the concept of of that. It's called We All Fall Down. It's a it's a, a bike tire that contains a, a full set of dominoes that perpetually knock themselves down and rise up again. And it's mounted to a piano, and uh, it lightly strums the piano and creates its own soundtrack. Sorry, a, a piano that's been torn apart, so you, it's just the harp of the piano, not, um, you know, there's no keys on it. And then also you uh, had the concept of trying to, I guess, hide symbols within the various pieces, whether it be chicken, things related to chickens or childhood, and just talk about yeah. your desire to, is that a way to tie it all together, all these different things? Oh yeah, certainly. Uh, and, uh, you know, all this, I gotta say, is inspired by uh, a, a thing called, or a, a group called Meow Wolf that's based in Santa Fe. And uh, I feel like they, um, I feel like it's sort of this movement of making these immersive experiential environments. I feel like that happening is or, or would have been in, inevitable, but Meow Wolf really did it right. And, um, and now, like, Tulsa and Chicago and Oklahoma City are sort of seeing that and going, yeah, we want one too. Hmm. Um, uh, sorry, I no, got off on a tangent. And <laughs> is, there, is there anything just that you're, is currently sort of brewing in your brain that you've either made sketches of and that oh, you yeah. want to expand it into more? Um, that oh, there's about a dozen things that I began with uh, for, for the experience that were never like fully realized, um, including a foosball table where instead of a foosball you would 
knock around a chicken egg and um, there was like a, a chicken contraption above you where these chickens would, um, when you swing a tetherball, the chickens would sort of randomly peck. One of the chickens would be pecking out a Morse code thing, and, yeah, which would connect back um, to this sort of outer space themed area of the, the piece. But that part didn't get to be fully realized. So I can maybe pitch that for. And these inspirations, they come from dreams, from just uh, free association thought. How does that, uh, how does something strike you and then sort of uh, then stand out to you like, oh, that's something I actually want to pursue. I guess sometimes it's working with found materials and thinking about like, what could I do with this? Um, in the case of the sleep chamber, I've just always uh, had a fascination with, with sleep. Part of, part of that uh, concept is it's supposed to be uh, a space where you can get eight hours of sleep in just an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, some of my other... Uh, Sleep of the future, which it almost kind of looks like a futuristic sort of uh, compartment uh, to a yeah. degree, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that design was created because of the fire code. Like, I had to have the ceiling open if there was going to be anyone inside it. So it had to be 70% open, 30% structure. So, uh, which ended up you know, um, sometimes uh, restraints or restrictions are end up with positive results, and I think in this mm -hmm. case it, it ended up kind of looking cool. cool. It, my original intent was to have it all sealed off so it would be sort of noise proof and the person inside would actually be able to get a great sleep. Um, some of my other um, work is, is highly conceptual too, like so when I used to work in LA, I would commute two to three hours a day, not necessarily driving a lot of miles, but you know, it's mm -hmm. traffic is horrible. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I started noticing license plates on cars that contained the number 666 sequentially. And you know, I was just like, okay, that's interesting. I'll take a picture of it. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll get 20 of these or something. It, and eventually, over nearly seven years, I collected, you know, and I was following cars <laughs> to get these photos on my commute to and from work. Um, but uh, so I, eventually I photographed 666 unique license plates, all with 666 uh, sequentially. It, it's, so that piece is called A Study of Ungodly License Plates. It's like <laughs> 25 feet wide by nine feet tall. It's just uh, 35 mil millimeter photographs of individual license plates. Um, so using that as an example, is that a good way to describe your process? Is, like, is it organic in that sense? Or do you have something, uh, do you form a lot more and then try and implement? Or how do, would you have a description of for your above. process? Yeah, I don't, I don't. I just like weird stuff, I guess. I you follow muses as they, um, yeah, and maybe a, as they first inspire you and then reveal themselves more than maybe you were expecting. Oh, definitely, yeah. And sometimes, like, actually, more often than not, like the process of creating a thing, you understand. Oh, this could be taken to the next level. Like, if I add the domino ring to the piano, it makes it even more cool. You know, now it's mm -hmm. creating its own soundtrack. Like. I didn't conceive everything whole cloth from the yeah. get go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, that's difficult for me. Like just to sit down with a blank piece of paper and just draw the thing. Uh, I prefer to like hands on start building the thing and then discover. Oh wow, I could go trial and thing. error and yeah. revelation. And, yeah. yeah, cool. cool. Sure. Um, I got one last question, but before I get to that, is there anything else? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm from Southern California, a town called Hemet, sort of near Palm Springs, um, and made it a lot easier to build things like a Halloween tunnel out of cardboard when you don't have to worry about rain, you know. Um, and you majored in? I majored in uh, uh, film. 
Yeah, at a community college, the end of college. Mm -hmm. It's in Cupertino. It's a great school. And basically, family brought you here about five years ago, and that's where yeah. you've created your base since then. And that's right. Yeah, yeah, I have a daughter, a ten-year-old daughter who lives here, so um, this is my home base whenever I'm not working. Traffic is a lot lighter. It's a lot lighter. <laughs> I, I think my overall quality of life is better in Tulsa than it was in LA. Yeah. Saw another question out here. Did I, or not? No. Okay. So just to wrap it up. Oh, did you have one? <laughs> and are you going to make a replication of it? Oh. <laughs> I don't think I'll do that, but I would like to repurpose it somehow. I'd like to maybe take some kind of cube cross section of it somehow. I don't know how to cut gum, maybe a water jet. Anyway, uh, um, freeze it first. Freeze it first, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question. Oh, um, yeah, I was, a, I was gone for four months in Hawaii, and uh, I think Daniel Sutliff, who's in the audience, sent me some pictures of it, and I was just so excited that, like, the administration there, when I first pitched the idea, there were some people who were really, like, thinking it was a horrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's hand sanitizer and gloves available, but... It's still, you know, it's a, it's a gross, weird thing, which I love. Like, I love things that have sort of this dynamic where they're, you don't know, is it pretty? Is it gross? Is it going to hurt me or make me laugh? Um, <laughs> which ultimately makes it provocative. Yeah, yeah, I think the best art does that. Um, so uh, Daniel sent me some photos when I was in Hawaii, and I was very pleased because the administration had talked about, like, maybe we're going to scrape it all off and start over, or, you know, there were different ways of going about it that weren't, weren't in my control, but I'm happy they've left it, and I hope they allow it to just become whatever it becomes um, before we close in December. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look like a school desk anymore. I mean, they, they don't look like school desks. Yes, she's been, she's been wonderful. It's been a pleasure getting to know her. I get, um, just as a final way to close, basic question, but an important one. What advice would you give to somebody who uh, is interested in pursuing, whether it be a career specifically like this or just uh, art in general and whatever their muse might be, based on your experience, what are some advice, pluses, minuses, whatever that you might recommend? Um, so if you're doing anything visual, I think, uh, I would suggest like it helps to have a variety of work and take a lot of pictures and, you know, people don't... Keep a record. Keep a record for sure. All people, like, people don't ask about your schooling. For in my case, they want to see pictures. They want to see what. What you've have done. you done? Yeah. Right. And in those pictures, like they can't tell how much time you've put into it. So make your thing perfect. You know, don't just like do it half-assed. Just it's. I'd say it's better to spend twice as long on a thing and make it really nice than you know make a dozen things that are crappy because they're not. They're not going to see the amount of time you put into it. Um, and the other thing I would say is there's one guy, uh, there's a lot of nepotism in my industry. <laughs> um, like I had a, a guy who vouched for me and happened to have another guy who, who worked for the Boingo video director who happened to end up being the lead sculptor on Godzilla. So mm -hmm. um, I, I just got really lucky with a lot of things. But. But um, you were putting yourself out there, which led to. Yeah, and I, I like let go of everything to like dedicate everything to this whatever it was at the time. Um, so I think that's important too. You just have to go, particularly in this industry, you just have to dive in deep, um, which could mean quitting your day job. Um, uh, beyond that, there's one guy who got in my union by just 
badgering, like calling the union every week, calling sculptors he didn't even know. Like he got their names and numbers from the union list. He'd call us and um, just ask us what he could do to get in or ask us, you know, um, I don't know, anything he could think of. And he just like was persistent for, I don't know, a year and a half and eventually some, you know, eventually an opening came and they're like, hey, how about this guy who's been badgering us? Let's <laughs> give him a shot. And it worked. You know? mm -hmm. Great. All right, thank you so much, David, for being here. And thank you to TCC and Tulsa Film Office um, and for all of you uh, joining us tonight. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you.